Thank you. I think St. Paul's is so um, fortunate to have so much musical talent. When our regular pianist and organist can't be here, we have very talented people to fill in, and we're certainly enjoying that. Thank you. Um, our, can you um, join me in the call to worship? Glorify God with me. Let's praise God together. We will glory in God. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. A poor one called, and God heard her. God saved her from her troubles. The eyes of God are on the helpless, and God's ears are attentive to their cries. I sought God, and God answered me. God delivered me from my fears. Those who look to God are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. Taste and see that God is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in God. God is close to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. me in the opening prayer. Source of life, of all that has been, of all that is, and of all that is yet to come, we come now to this place with all that we are and all that we have, with all that we are not and all that we have not, to encounter the sacred in ourselves and in our neighbors. 
for it is there. Spirit of all things, great and small, awaken us, we pray. As we come to worship, may we be attentive so that we can see you, great God of diversity, in every moment, in every place, in every face. Amen. Let us join together and remind ourselves what it is we believe is found in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of God be with you. Greet each other in the same way.
I might say today that uh, Tom Hevelin, our organist emeritus, is who's playing on the organ today for us. Uh, Carol, Carol Garris, was, who was the prelude. Uh, we have uh, Becky Anderson, who's playing the piano at other times. So they're doing tag team piano and organ today. So we're happy, that we're very pleased that they're all working for us and, and doing that today very well. Today is an interesting day. What time is it right now? I don't have and it's 10 minutes to 11. It's not 11, 11, but those of you who are veterans, would you stand, please? Those of you who have served. Today is the day. We couldn't have had a presidential election without you. We couldn't have a Senate without you. We couldn't have the seats to fight over in the Senate and the House without you. Without you, there probably would no longer be a Washington Monument. There wouldn't be a Lincoln Monument. Without you, we wouldn't be watching movies about Lincoln. Without you, we couldn't be here, maybe. Because the time of your life that you gave made it possible, all of it possible. Some of you fought in wars. Some of you kept the peace. Some of you helped supply. Some of you fought next to those who died. All of it important, each and every bit of it, and all of it deserving of our praise and our gratitude. I never served in the military. People in my family did. And I know what it meant to my family when someone would go off. We have people in our family now who are in the military and we have a fighter pilot. We have other people who are serving other ways in the military. But every time the fighter pilot goes off to combat, we worry about him in Iraq or Afghanistan. And I'm sure when you had your day in the service, your family worried about you. And they were happy the day you came home. You're the people who we bless. You and those who went before you made us who we are. The other day I went by Fort Amanda it's been 200 years, there's 75 soldiers, American soldiers buried at Fort Amanda. They were buried there in 1812. Their bodies have lain there for 200 years. They served us. They kept the English from invading from Detroit and coming in and taking back what America had fought so hard to have. And so this is the 200th anniversary of that war and the 200th anniversary of their deaths. But you stand with those men 200 years ago and further back. In that same cemetery, I saw a gravestone of a man who died in 1827. But on his gravestone it said, fought at Bunker Hill in the Revolutionary War, the first engagement that made our country go to where it is. He's there. And you all stand with him. In that great tradition of making us a free people and keeping us free. So on behalf of the congregation, I want to again thank you. As long as I'm here, I will thank you every year at this time. Because what you have done for me and for the rest of us can never really be paid for can never really, should never really be forgotten and should always be honored. And so we thank you and God bless you.
Our first scripture lesson is from the Old Testament book of Ruth, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. In those days, when the boy Samuel was serving the Lord under the direction of Eli, there were very few messages from the Lord, and visions from him were quite rare. One night, Eli, who was now almost blind, was sleeping in his own room. Samuel was sleeping in the sanctuary where the sacred covenant box was. Before dawn, while the lamp was still burning, the Lord called Samuel. He answered, yes, sir, and ran to Eli and said, you called me, and here I am. But Eli answered, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. So Samuel went back to bed. And also chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. Eli, who was very worried about the covenant box, was sitting in his seat beside the road, staring. The man spread the news throughout the town, and everyone cried out in fear. Eli heard the noise and asked, what is all this noise about? The man returned to Eli, hurried to Eli to tell him the news. Eli was now 98 years old and almost completely blind. The man said, I have escaped from the battle and have run all the way here today. Eli asked him, what happened, my son? The messenger answered, Israel ran away from the Philistines. It was a terrible defeat for us. Besides that, your sons Hophni and Phinehas were killed, and God's covenant box was captured. Our New Testament reading is from Hebrews chapter 94. Or chapter 9, uh, verses 24 to 28. For Christ did not go into a man-made holy place, which was a copy of the real one. He went into heaven itself, where he now appears on our behalf in the presence of God. The Jewish high priest goes into the most holy place every year with the blood of an animal. But Christ did not go in to offer himself many times. For then he would have had to suffer many times ever since the creation of our world. Instead, now when all ages of time are nearing the end, he has appeared once and for all to remove sin through the sacrifice of himself. Everyone must die once and after that be judged by God. In the same manner, Christ also was offered in sacrifice once to take away the sins of many. He will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are waiting for him. From the book of Mark, chapter 12, <clears throat> hear the word of the Lord. A large crowd was gathering to Jesus gladly. I'm sorry, was listening to Jesus gladly. And as he taught them, he said, watch out for the teachers of the law who like to walk around in their long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplace, who choose the reserved seats in the synagogues and the best places at feasts. They take advantage of widows and they rob them of their homes and then make a show of saying long prayers. Well, their punishment will be all the worse. And as Jesus sat near the temple treasury, he watched the people as they dropped in their money. Many rich men dropped in a lot of money, and then a poor widow came along and dropped in two little copper coins worth about a penny. He called his disciples together and said to them, I tell you that this poor widow put more in the offering box than all the others, for the others put in what they had to spare of their riches, but she, poor as she is, put in all she had. She gave all she had to live on. May God add the blessing to this reading and your hearing of this word. Amen.
Good morning. You guys have been working really hard, haven't you? Yeah, I know. You come here on Sundays and you're practicing for the Christmas play. That's a lot of work, isn't it? Are you having a good time, though? Yeah? Okay. I'm happy to hear that. Do you know that today is a special today, day today? What is it? Veterans Day. Yes, it's Veterans Day. In Veterans Day, we celebrate the fact that there were people who served in the Army, the Navy, the Marines, the Air Force, the Coast Guard. I haven't forgotten anybody, have I? No, okay. All the services that they served in. And they served our country well. That's why we're still a country. God has blessed us with a lot of people who love this country and a lot of people who care about it. Now, sometimes we disagree. I know you saw all those ads on television before the presidential election where everybody was disagreeing. Kind of messed up your TV time, didn't it? Yeah. I mean, there were more important things you thought to watch maybe than those. But in a land where we disagree, we can also agree that we can disagree, that we can have different points of view. And we can have different points of view here because the veterans and the people who are in the armed services now make sure we're free to have different points of view. We can have all the paper and we can have all the presidents and we can have all the senators and all the congressmen we ever have. But if we don't have people who are willing to go and take care of business for our country and keep others who want to hurt us away from us, we didn't have people like that, we wouldn't be free. They're the ones who keep us free. They're the ones who have helped us be who we are. And they're the ones who have helped us be able to sit here today in a church building and let me talk to you about God. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So when you have, you have somebody in your family who's a veteran, does anybody here have somebody in their family who was in the Army, Navy, Air Force, someplace like that? Raise your hands, yeah, yeah. You know, I have people who've been in the service, who've been in the service and served, yeah. All of our families in some way are touched by that. We have somebody, maybe a grandma, grandpa. In our family, my wife's father was in World War II. To be in World War II, you have to be pretty, pretty, pretty old now to have been in World War II. And he's 94. I mean, he was in the Navy. And I'm sure you have people in your families who we're in different places. We have members of our church who served in the, in the armed forces and did things to help our country be great. It's a sacrifice that they make because they give up years of their life to do that. So always think about them on Veterans Day and think about how they have helped us to be who we are and how God has blessed us with those people who cared enough to serve this country well. Let's pray. God, we are your children, and your children gather here in this place to say we are grateful. We are grateful that you have given us a country that is free, and you've given us people who serve this country and who love it and share their life so that they, the others might live and, and be free too. Bless them and bless those who have gone on in the service of this country to be in your heavenly realm and give them a special place in your heaven. And watch over our children. Be near them. Strengthen them. Encourage them in their faith as they grow. And bless them, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for coming up.
This morning, during Sunday school time, Rich was telling me, not during Sunday school time, but he was telling me that during Sunday school time, the children were coming around and looking at what they do back on the console and how they set up the TV program and, and how they set up the microphones and all that. And uh, Rich said one of the children asked a question. And it's a very important question. He wanted to know this. He wanted to know when Reverend, Bray, Reverend Ed, he said, when Reverend Ed is standing out there like he stands on the edge of the steps, and I know many of you are concerned because I always put my toes over the edge like that. He wanted to know, if Reverend Ed ever falls, can we put that on America's Funniest Home Videos? <laughs> See if we can arrange that. We could use an extra $10,000. <laughs> Nothing is ever gained without first risking loss. Nothing is ever gained without first risking loss. In life, there are no guarantees. So no one is going to give you what you want on a silver platter. You have to take risks. You have to risk falling off the edge. You have to risk not being able to do what you really want with your life all the time. But I'm sad to say that there is a prevailing attitude that has captured our culture. It seems to have started back in the 1980s, as I recall. It started gaining momentum in the 1990s. It took more hold as the century turned. And that attitude has become a, a culture of lack, L-A-C-K, a culture of lack. In other words, we have become more focused on what we do not have, what we do not possess, what we do not own, rather than on the blessings that are already all around us. It seems to be a sickness that has infested all economic levels. Even the very wealthy cannot be satiated when you have a culture of lack among you. Many want more money, more power, larger homes, more exclusive cars, bigger golden parachutes. And they, when the poll results on happiness come out, they are still more concerned about what they lack. And think that they can't be happy because they don't have everything they want. If this culture of lack in the U.S. wasn't so pathetic, it would be comical. It would be comical because there are people in our world who are starving. There are people in our world who are happy to have a tent for a permanent shelter, a bucket of clean water to drink from, some clothes to wear, and a blanket for warmth all night. There are people in the world living like that. The story of Naomi and Ruth is a story in which the movement is a movement of emptiness to fullness. Emptiness to fullness. It is a story about how two courageous women were willing to take risks. And we talked a little bit about them last week as well. And they took those risks and they stepped out on faith and took control of their destiny. Ruth, Naomi's daughter-in-law, you'll recall, was left childless, childless when her husband died. Naomi's husband, Elimelech, had died a long time ago. So the two widows traveled together from Moab, which was Ruth's home country, to Judah, which was Naomi's home country. Ruth, who could have stayed in Moab with her own family of origin, she made a commitment to spend the rest of her life with her mother-in-law and to face whatever the two of them had to face in life, but they would face it together. When Ruth and Naomi arrived in Bethlehem, the hometown of Naomi, it was harvest time. So that the two of them could have food to eat, Ruth would go out and she would glean, you know, the, the stuff that was left in the field after the reapers went through, the harvesters went through, that she would glean from that field and she would bring that food home, that grain home, so that they would have something to eat. They were happy to have what they could find left lying on the ground after the harvest had been taken in. They were happy to have that because it was, it was food to eat. It happened, however, that Ruth was gleaning in the field of a man named Boaz. Boaz noticed Ruth and asked his reapers, who's that woman? And they told him she was the young Moabite woman who had come with Naomi. 
Boaz had heard of her goodness. He had heard of her faithfulness to Naomi. So he ordered his reapers to purposely leave behind extra of the crop. Leave it behind for Ruth to glean because she, he so admired Ruth for her goodness to Naomi. And so it was that way until the harvest was done. They were to leave her more stuff and she could even come up and take stuff with the reapers. Then it was time to do the threshing. So the Judeans would do most of that between the roughly 5 p.m. and darkness. And they did it at that time of day because that then was when the wind blew and they needed the wind to do this. You see, to separate the grain from the chaff, they would build platforms up a distance off the ground. And then they would toss the harvest up into the air so that the wind, which usually blew at that time, would separate what was good from what was waste. And then at nightfall, after a long day of harvesting and threshing, the farmer would lie down on the threshing floor close to the piles of grain he and his reapers had produced, and he'd go to sleep. They had to do that so nobody would steal their grain so they can get it out to market the next day. Ruth may not have known it, but her mother-in-law, Naomi, had realized after a while that Boaz was a distant relative to her deceased husband, Elimelech. Naomi also knew that the law required the closest male related to a widowed woman who had not given birth to a child. The law required that closest male relative to take that woman as a wife, and then she could have a son for her deceased husband. So in other words, that closer relative became like a surrogate for that deceased husband. And then that way, Naomi knew, you know, if Ruth were to get hooked up with Boaz and get married to him, why, they could have a son and then I would have a grandson. And so she also knew, too, that somewhere around Bethlehem, there was a plot of land that belonged to her deceased husband, Elimelech. Ruth may not have known all this, but Naomi did. So on the evening, Boaz was threshing the crop, and already Boaz had gotten to know Ruth, and he really liked her, thought she was a great woman, wonderful person, doing wonderful things, helping Naomi out. Boaz was threshing the crop. Naomi told Ruth, hey, wash up. Use your best smelling soap. Put on your prettiest dress. Go over to Boaz's threshing floor where he's going to be sleeping. Lay down on the floor with him and uncover his feet. And when he wakes up, ask him to marry you. And the rest is history. Boaz cleared the way for Ruth to become his wife. They were married and they had a son named Obed who was then considered to be a descendant of Elimelech thus restoring Naomi's family, and everyone was happy. What am I saying by retelling this story to you? I'm saying if Ruth had not taken the risk that she took by traveling with her mother-in-law Naomi to a new land where she had never been, and by doing what had to be done to feed her and Naomi, and by going out and gleaning in the fields of Judah, by watching out for Naomi's welfare, giving loving care to the aged Naomi, Ruth would have never been known and respected by the people of Judah, and Boaz would have never met her. But Ruth risked it all. Ruth did not go around complaining about what she did not have. She invested herself in the blessings that she already had. And chief among those blessings was being able to be a part of Naomi's life. And as one writer commented in this story, on this story, he wrote, Ruth's solidarity with Naomi, industry and diligence, willingness to take risks, and eventual union with Boaz enabled Naomi, who really had no hope, to be reintegrated into the life of the community. Naomi, who had been gone for so long, came back, and now she was somebody. She had a grandson. Then there's Boaz, who comes into the picture also as one who has much, 
He was a wealthy farmer, a wealthy guy, and he was willing to share what he had. He found great joy, as we can tell as we read the scripture, in paying his workers well. He found great joy in feeding his workers well. And he found great joy in making sure that his workers left sufficient of the crop laying in the field so that he could help anyone in need who had to glean for a living. He particularly wanted to help Ruth because he had heard of, his, of her kindness and of her loyalty to Naomi. Now you may think that Boaz had designs on Ruth as a potential wife. But remember, it wasn't Boaz who proposed marriage. It was Ruth. His aim was to help them in the first place. He wasn't looking for anything from it. Ruth's proposal of marriage was simply a bonus. And so we find that Ruth and Boaz together embody the meaning of loyalty, kindness, and faithfulness over and above what ordinarily is the norm. And why? Because they didn't spend their lives worried about what they lacked, worried about what they didn't have, but instead rejoicing in the blessings they both had in good times and in bad times. There was no culture of lack in their vocabulary. What we see happening around us today is, in our culture, a spiritual problem. When people, for instance, will stand in long lines for hours just to get the latest iPhone, there really is something wrong with our culture. When we have to have the latest, and we have to have the best, and we have to have the greatest before everyone else, and stand in lines for the privilege of writing a check for that, for what is absolutely and not, es not essential, absolutely not essential in our lives, but only because we've got to have own, to own one, then the culture of lack has taken over. That's what's going on. People who have stuff still believe they don't have enough. People who have stuff that they have, to, that they have to actually go out and rent storage places to put their stuff still believe they don't have enough. You've seen that around you. I should have gotten into the storage business a long time ago. And then now they have this show on TV where it's called Storage Wars. Have you ever seen that? Where people go around and where folks haven't paid their rent for a while on their, their garage or the door that they got stuff in. Well, they have people that go around and they bid on, they can't go in there and look at everything. They just look at it. They can't go in. But they bid on those garage doors. They open them up, they cut the lock, open them up and say, well, these folks haven't paid their rent, so here's, here's this in here. What do you bid me? And then they start off and the auctioneer bids away. And here's all this stuff sitting there that people have had so much, they forgot they had it there. They didn't even have time to come and get it before they didn't pay the rent. We're in a culture of lack, thinking we have to have more and more and more. There are people standing in line around the world, too, just to get food. I'm sure the people suffering loss in New Jersey aren't very worried about standing in line for an iPhone right now. But that is just one example. I can give you a boatload of examples that we can see going on around us. People looking for something to make them feel good and make their life easier, overlooking the blessings that they already have abounding all around them. We have to take, we have to take the risk of cultivating a culture instead of blessings. To combat the sickness of worry about what we don't have, we all need to begin celebrating all that is good in our lives. We all need to begin celebrating all that is precious about our, our land. We all need to begin celebrating all that is great about our people and not complaining and whining about what we don't have or that we don't have control. Or that it's not ours. 
but it's theirs. We need to begin celebrating our purpose for being, for why we even exist on the planet as a church, as a nation, as a people. We need to see that generosity in all things is one answer to that dilemma. We need to take a risk on investing our lives and our fortunes in one another, which is also an answer to the problem. Just as both Ruth and Boaz were willing to enrich the lives of other people beyond themselves. Ruth gave everything up to help Naomi until the day she would die. Boaz cared enough to leave crops. He could have sold to make his wallet fatter. Now, he could have sold those crops, but he cared enough to leave the crops laying in the field to help others who were in need. This kind of kindness and concern for others beyond just our own families is essential. Is essential. Most of all, we need to risk it all with God which actually is not a risk, but it is a sure thing. God has invested in you and me. God has invested in all of us. God has given us what we need, not necessarily what we want, not necessarily what we think will make our life better and that we should have it because of that, not necessarily something we have to stand in line for hours to get because it's the latest thing out there. God has given us what we need. And God has blessed us with hope for the future, which is found in Jesus the Christ. Well, by recognizing the blessings we already have, and by not slipping into an attitude of being upset about what you don't have, by investing yourself in the lives of others through the generosity of your caring, your time, your funds, And by placing your life in the hands of God through our Savior Jesus Christ, you can find spiritual restoration. Knowing your your life has more meaning and knowing that that your life is no longer defined by the money, by the power, or the things you lack. In a book called Enough, written by Adam, um, I don't remember his name now, he's a Methodist pastor, didn't write it down. But in a book written by him, Adam Hamilton, he talks about a very wealthy man he had in his congregation. And uh, the man went out and he bought a seven-year-old car. And he couldn't figure out why he would do that. And the man was really happy driving. It was a Honda. Really happy driving this car. The man told him, he said, did it because it gives me more money to give away, more money to help people. How do we use what we have already? How do we use the blessings that God has given us already? How do we use them? That's a real question. You must first be willing to risk it all in order to truly find what truly makes your life full. I read the other day about a man who had tremendous wealth. He gave a particular university millions of dollars to build some buildings that they desperately needed. A few years later in the stock market, he lost it all. Lost all of his wealth. And he was asked if he regretted giving that money to that college now. His reply was, not at all. I'll always be remembered more for what I gave away than for how much I kept. It seems risky to give away your life to a cause. It seems risky to give away your fortune to the service of others. It seems risky to give away your soul to God when you cannot see God at all, but in your heart you know God is real. There are risks, however, well worth taking because in the end being restored to a celebration of life being restored to a celebration of blessings is far more profitable than sinking in the quagmire of despair over what you don't have over what you have lost there's more to gain 
when you give your life to God. Ruth's story was one in which the movement, as I told you, was one of emptiness to fullness. She started out empty. She had nothing. Naomi had nothing. They had no idea what was going to happen to them when they got back to Judah. They had no idea what, what was waiting for them because they had nothing. But by using what they've been blessed with, by believing that what they had was enough, God gave them more. And God blessed them. And so it is with you and me. That can be our story too. If you feel empty, God can help you feel full. If you feel that you're at the bottom of the heap and nobody cares about you, God loves you. And you are more important to God than anything on earth. If you feel that you have nothing to contribute, that you have nothing to give, God says otherwise because God made you the unique person you are with the talents that you have, the abilities that you have, the thoughts that you have, the person that you are. God made you that way. And you have something to give. Young, old, in between, frail, strong, whatever you may be. You have much to give because you are a child of God. We learn from the Bible stories, Ruth committed herself completely. Boaz was a generous man. Naomi was a caring person. And together they teach us that we can be too. That we can be the people God has called us to be. Not folks who go around whining about what they don't have, we need to be people, instead of whining, who go around and say, why not? Why not? Why shouldn't I support this? Why shouldn't I help that person? Why shouldn't I make a difference over here? Why not? Why not? God is calling. Let us pray. Oh God, you call us to be a people knowing that we are already blessed to get beyond that thing that draws us back and says, we just got to have one more blessing. We just got to have one more thing. We just got to have that thing that would be better for us or that thing that would make my life, I think, easier. Or we got to have this or we got to have that. Help us, God, to not be held down by that because that is a sickness that's holding a lot of us back from being fully the people we need to be. Help us to move from a, an attitude of lacking to a, a gratitude for blessings and to praise you for it. Lord, we pray this day for those whom we love. We pray this day for our president. We pray for our nation. We pray for our Congress, our Senate. We pray for those who are at the helm to feel the guidance of your hand and know that you are God. We pray today for all the veterans who have served this country so well and helped us to continue to be free. Bless them. We pray for all those who lost their lives, gave the fullest measure, who lost their lives in war and conflict and for their families, that they may never have died in vain that what we do will always honor their memory and keep our nation strong. We pray for those who are serving us now, whose boots are on foreign lands, who risk their lives every day because our country sent them there. Bring them home. May there be peace. May there come a day when all our soldiers and sailors and Marines and Coast Guardsmen ever do is train. Train to be good at what they do, but never have to do it. Would that that day would come 
that there would be peace and wholeness in all the earth, that all of God's people would be gathered together on the face of this earth and glorify God, and that we would realize that there's no reason for division among us, that there's no reason for struggle, that we all want to be in the same place with the same one, you. Bless us all, we pray, and forgive us of our sins. Strengthen us and encourage us in our daily living so that we might truly pray what Jesus prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have an opportunity to respond to what God does for every one of us through the giving of our time, through the giving of our talents, and through the giving of our treasures. And what a blessing that is for us. Because in order to have a strong faith, we have to give. In order to believe as we should believe, it's important to give of yourself in whatever way you are able. Just as Jesus pointed out to his disciples, as you heard read in the scripture today, the woman who gave her two pennies, her gift was just as important as the man who gave thousands because that was all she had to live on. What we give is important to the work of the Lord. Bless God with your giving. <clears throat>
God, it's so good to be able to give. It feels good. It helps us to know that we're part of something larger than we ourselves. And that through it, we can make a difference in the lives of many people. Bless the gifts that have been brought to this place. Bless the hands that prepared them. And may they prosper in the sharing of the gospel, in the feeding of the hungry, in the clothing of the naked, in the housing of the homeless. May they prosper and glorify you and bless you. Receive this offering we bring today to honor you and to glorify you as our creator and our God. Through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior, we pray. Amen. God grant that we would be a nation that wants all people to be free and all people to live in harmony. That's our call. And that's our blessing that we have received. When you walk from this place, remember to whom you belong. You belong to the great God Almighty, the author of the universe, the one who created the black holes, the one who created the planets and the solar systems, the one who made life to be and continues to speak to this world. When you walk from this place, be glad you belong to that God because that God loves you and has sent his son Jesus Christ that you might be saved. Go serve God well. Go serve God well. 
Do what God has called you to do in the world and be a blessing so that God's blessings will abound in your life. And God will bless you for it. God's face in the end will shine on you and God will grant you peace.